Hi, my name is Jamie Miller, and I'm one of the registered dietitians at Cooperman Barnabas Medical Center. In this presentation, I'll talk a little bit about what happens nutrition-wise after a stroke, and then I'll focus the rest of the presentation on nutrition for stroke prevention. So in the event that a person does experience a stroke, um, it can potentially negatively impact their nutritional health. Um, they may be more at risk for malnutrition and dehydration um, because they may have a decreased ability to perform daily activities that are associated with eating. Some examples would be physically going to the grocery store and doing their own food shopping, um, preparing meals for themselves at home, feeding themselves, and also chewing and swallowing. If they don't experience any of these issues, um, they are encouraged to just follow a general healthy diet um, to help prevent an additional stroke from occurring. If they do have difficulty chewing or swallowing or performing any of the daily activities associated with eating, then they might not be meeting their calorie and nutrient needs and malnutrition may occur. So if a person does experience, you know, chewing and swallowing difficulties after a stroke, they may need a modified consistency solids or liquids in order to make sure that they're safely able to eat. The speech language pathologist plays a major role in this area, so they are going to perform a swallowing evaluation to determine whether it's safe for the, the person to eat and if they do note any chewing or swallowing issues, they may recommend um, thickened liquids or chopped solids or pureed foods um, in order to make sure that they're not at risk for aspiration. Patients may also require one-to-one -one feeding assistance if they are having difficulty moving their arm to feed themselves or you know, have any other feeding issues. Um, the dietitian uh, can recommend or order oral nutrition supplements uh, to help the person meet their calorie and protein needs if they're not meeting them with just food intake alone. And the dietitian will also provide education on the diet consist consistency that the speech language pathologist orders for the patient. So that way they can um, consume the right solid consistency solids and liquids when they go home um, or their caregiver will be able to prepare their food safely and uh, appropriately to make sure that they aren't um, you know, more at risk for aspiration. So if the speech language patholo pathologist does deem the, the person not appropriate for um, oral intake, so it's not safe for them to eat by mouth, they're at risk for aspiration, they may need an alternate route of nutrition. Um, so dietitians like to say, if the gut works, use it. And that means that if the gastrointestinal tract is functional, the preferred method of nutrition support would be tube feeding. Um, this may be temporary um, in the form of a nasogastric tube um, providing the uh, nutrition support. Otherwise, if it is a more permanent feeding tube, then there are, um, you know, peg tubes that can be inserted um, that can last a long time. So that person is able to get their nutrition um, through the tube. If for whatever reason the tube feeding is contraindicated, so there's some an issue or a blockage in the GI tract, um, then we can also provide IV nutrition or TPN. So when it comes to stroke and nutrition, prevention is really key. Um, there are a number of controllable risk factors for stroke, and a lot of them do um, have to do with nutrition. Um, so controllable risk factors for stroke include being overweight or obese, having a sedentary lifestyle, um, elevated blood pressure chronically, um, high cholesterol, heart disease, diabetes, and smoking. So for most of these, nutrition does play a role, whether it be preventing some of these chronic conditions or managing them with nutrition. So achieving and maintaining a healthy weight is very important in uh, preventing a stroke. Um, so overweight and obesity are associated with increased risk for ischemic stroke. And if you are overweight or obese, even just a weight loss of 5 to 10% of your body weight can have significant health benefits, including um, a reduced risk for stroke. So for example, if a person weighs 250 pounds, um, a 
5% weight loss would be about 12 and a half pounds. So their goal weight would be 237 and a half pounds. Um, any further additional weight loss, you know, is obviously beneficial as well. But even just the 5% weight loss cuts the risk for stroke and other chronic health conditions um, quite a bit. So in order to achieve and maintain a healthy weight, um, decreasing total da daily calorie intake and increasing physical activity work together to help promote healthy weight reduction. So we wanna increase our energy expenditure through exercise and decrease the amount of energy that we're consuming in the form of foods and beverages throughout the day in order to be in a calorie deficit um, for weight loss, sustainable weight loss. So some basic tips for weight loss, um, eating enough, so eating at least three meals per day, um, planning ahead to make healthful decisions more convenient. So whether that be, you know, prepping your meals for the week on a Sunday or even just cutting up fruits and vegetables um, to have them on hand so they're easy to grab and go, you're less apt to grab maybe a packaged, you know, snack um, out of the cabinet if you have fresh fruits and vegetables available, available for you. Um, on the go and focusing on portion sizes. Um, so people like to use the plate method. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this before, um, having about half of your plate fruits and vegetables or non-starchy vegetables, 25% um, or a quarter of your plate, high fiber carbohydrates and another quarter of your plate, your lean protein. Um, so Switching to low fat or fat free dairy products can help cut back on the saturated fat intake and also the um, total calorie intake. Also, choosing leaner cuts of meat, so our poultry, fish, um, plant based proteins like nuts and beans, these are all going to be um, lower in saturated fat and more heart healthy, as well as they tend to be a little bit lower in calories. Focusing on low calorie hydration is also important. Making sure that you're staying hydrated throughout the day is key. Um, sometimes our body can mistake um, thirst for hunger. So making sure that we're drinking a lot of fluids throughout the day, making our beverage of choice water. Um, you can put fruit into your water like lemon or some people like to even put cucumber in their water to flavor it. Um, whatever works for you and gets you to drink your water, that's great. Um, you can also go for um, flavored seltzers, flavored waters, um, zero calorie beverages are best. Um, and that's because we do want to also reduce intake of added sugar. So they do list um, added sugars on the nutrition facts labels now. So it is easier for consumers to make informed decisions when it comes to what products they're consuming. Um, a lot of the sugar sweetened beverages will provide us with uh, calories because of the added sugars, um, but they don't really provide us with much other nutrition. So no real vitamins or minerals or fiber or anything else, just the calories. So it can be a little bit more difficult to achieve and maintain weight loss if you're consuming a lot of the sugar sweetened beverages and you know other concentrated sweets. Mindful eating is also a buzzword recently. Um, so really being present while you're eating, minimizing distractions whenever, whenever possible, really taking your time, chewing your food well, really focusing on the textures, the flavors, the smells, you know, really enjoying the experience of eating and also allowing your body time to let you know that it's full. So taking breaks between bites, putting your fork down. If you are with a group of people, enjoying their company, enjoying the conversation, um, you know, we really just want to avoid mindless eating whenever possible. So at nighttime, this might be an issue for a lot of people. You know, many people struggle with sitting in front of the TV and kind of mindlessly snacking out of a package or a container. So portioning foods out first, you know, minimizing those distractions. These are all ways that we can pay a little bit more attention to what we're eating and really enjoying that food because we do want to enjoy eating. It's one of the many, you know, joys in life. So we do want to enjoy our food and we don't want to feel like we're restricting ourselves at all. So my plate, here's just um, some more guidelines in terms of the plate method, um, making your half of your plate fruits and veggies. Um, they do provide us with a lot of fiber and vitamins and minerals, um, varying the colors of the fruits and vegetables that you consume is important to make sure that we're getting all of the different vitamins and minerals, um, aiming for mostly non-starchy uh, non vegetables, as mentioned before. Um, 
really focusing on eating mostly whole grains in our grains group. So on my plate, they have a saying, make half of your grains whole grains. And that's to make sure that we're getting enough fiber and we're getting that the full nutrition from that whole grain. During the refining process, when they're making the grains into, you know, white products like white bread, white rice, things like that, you know, they do strip a lot of um, the good nutrition from the grain and we're just left with that starchy part. They do add some of the um, vitamins, the B vitamins and some other nutrients back, but unfortunately it's not all of the nutrients that were taken out and the white products are often very low in fiber. Um, when it comes to the protein group, we want to vary the types of proteins that we consume. So doing some plant-based proteins, um, plant-based diet is a very, you know, popular um, Freeze nowadays, so shifting more towards uh, plant-based sources of protein, so beans and nuts and uh, tofu and you know other meat alternatives. Um, also, when we're eating animal proteins, going for the leaner um, proteins and uh, the way that we prepare our foods matters as well. So instead of frying, do more grilling, baking, broiling, things like that. Um, and from our dairy group, three servings of a day will get you the calcium that you need, um, but choosing the lower fat or um, fat free alternatives to the whole dairy products can make sure that you're consuming um, less saturated fat, which um, is considered to be an unhealthy fat or um, but you're still getting the. Calcium that you need and vitamin D, which is very important. So another tip would be to focus on nutrient dense foods. So when we see calories, um, you can basically think about energy content because that's you know what calories refer to the energy content of a food. Um, so the calories refer to how much energy is provided per serving size, so per unit measure of food. We do need calories for our bodies to function properly, but over time, if we are consuming more calories than we need. Um, it can lead to weight gain and as a result, you know, other health issues. So choosing nutrient dense foods will make sure that you get the, uh, the most out of each calorie. So you really get, you know, more bang for your buck. So nutrient dense foods are going to be high in nutrients, um, but relatively low in calories. So they'll be high in fiber, um, essential amino acids and fatty acids, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, um, as opposed to our calorie dense foods, which are you know, gonna be high in calories, but really don't provide much additional nutritional value. So they would be high in nutrients that we actually wanna limit in the diet. So added sugars, sodium, total calories, saturated and trans fat. Um, these are all things that we wanna try to cut back on for a healthy diet. So energy, uh, calorie dense or energy dense foods, um, we want to try to have more as a treat, um, more infrequently and really focusing on eating um, the majority of our foods as nutrient dense foods. Another really you know, important component is exercise. So getting moving, um, aiming for at least 150 minutes of moderate aerobic exercise per week, um, and also working on some strength training at least two days per week. Um, if you have been you know, on the sedentary side, not really been as active as you'd like recently, start slowly, you know, doing even just five to 10 minutes per day. Um, it helps and then just gradually increasing the frequency and the duration of the activity um, and really choosing activities that you enjoy. So you definitely want don't want to feel like it's a chore to exercise. Um, you can do things like Zumba or, you know, dancing, walking, swimming when it's nice out or even at the gym, you know, anything that you really enjoy doing um, will help you to make sure that you stay motivated to continue with it. Some people also like to work out with friends. Um, that way they stay accountable and it can be more enjoyable. Um, you know, scheduling time to exercise, just like you schedule a meeting or any other event, you know, put it in your planner. Try not to let more than two days go by without including some type of activity. So schedules can be crazy, but you know, we do need to make time for ourselves and really get our bodies moving and our hearts pumping. Um, Controlling blood pressure is another very important um, component to stroke prevention. So consuming a diet that is heart healthy and low in sodium is really important um, to help manage blood pressure. 
So the DASH diet, um, actually DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. Um, hypertension is chronically elevated blood pressure. So this diet is actually designed to help lower blood pressure and it has been proven to be able to do so. Um, it's an eating pattern similar to the Mediterranean diet. Um, it emphasizes a lot of whole foods like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, low fat dairy products, poultry and fish and nuts, um, so heart healthy fats, lean proteins, you know, high fiber, these are all great things. Um, you know, it really um, it allows you to eat all of the foods that you enjoy, but helps, you know, to moderate the portions of those foods and really, you know, focusing on the fresh foods to minimize the sodium content. It's also, you know, higher in potassium, which can also help with blood pressure. The American Heart Association actually recommends limiting to so sodium intake to um, 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams per day. Um, and for a little bit of perspective, um, the average American currently consumes about 3,400 milligrams per day. So we do tend to um, exceed our sodium needs on a daily basis, um, you know, because of our a lot of reliance on um, convenience foods and frozen dinners and um, restaurant foods and things like that. So trying to cook more at home and use uh, alternatives to salt when flavoring your food can definitely help. So just some basic tips for reducing sodium intake, um, not adding salt to your food when you're cooking or while you're eating, um, just one teaspoon of salt will actually provide 2,300 milligrams of sodium. So adding salt to your food, you know, a lot of our, our foods already have sodium already. So, um, you know, adding salt to your food will just increase your total daily sodium intake. Um, looking at food labels, choosing low sodium foods, things that have less than 140 milligrams of sodium per serving are considered low sodium items. Um, being aware of common high sodium foods. So even if you don't have a nutrition facts label, if you're out somewhere um, and you're not sure, uh, being aware of foods that are typically very high in sodium and trying to stay away from them or limit your consumption of them, you know, that'll help to stay within that sodium goal as well. Some common high sodium foods include um, cu uh, cured meats and cold cuts, bacon, um, soups, fast foods, frozen dinners, um, cheeses, breads, pizza, um, pickles. So these are just some that we you know, can be aware of when we're out. This is probably gonna be very high in sodium and look for lower sodium options. Flavoring foods, we obviously want to make sure our food is flavorful and enjoyable, but we don't want all of the extra salt. So we can flavor foods with citrus, like lemon or lime juice. We can use vinegar, fresh or dried herbs, spices, um, and they also do make a lot of low sodium or sodium free um, seasoning blends in the store. If you go down the spice aisle, you can find you know quite a few options and you can try them out and see what you like the best. Um, there's also lower sodium condiments. Um, so really taking the time out when you go grocery shopping and comparing labels and choosing the lower sodium items. Another important um, component to stroke prevention when it comes to nutrition is maintaining healthy blood cholesterol levels. So this has a lot to do with the types of fat that we consume in our diet. Um, we have, you know, the love it, which is the unsaturated fats, polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats. These are the heart healthy fats that we want to really include more of in our diet. Um, they are lower rates of cardiovascular and all cause mortality. They lower our LDL or bad cholesterol levels and triglyceride levels, and they provide essential fats that your body needs, but can't produce itself. So the essential fatty acids that we need um, the saturated fat, these are the ones that we want to really limit. So they increase the risk of cardiovascular disease and raise LDL cholesterol levels and sometimes triglyceride levels as well. So these are going to be more solid at room temperature. There are, you know, red meats, um, heavy cream, whole milk, you know, whole dairy products, butter, um, fried foods. They tend to be, you know, more solid at room temperature and they do have the tendency to elevate our LDL or bad cholesterol. Um, lastly, we want to try to stay away as much as possible from artificial trans fat, um, hydrogenated oils. These are, um, you know, 
man-made fats for the most part, um, and they increase the risk of heart disease. They actually lower our good cholesterol levels and they raise our bad cholesterol levels. Um, so we do wanna stay away from trans fat as much as possible. Um, really being sure that a product doesn't have any trans fat in it. Um, you'd have to look at the ingredients, the ingredients list on the label. Um, so any product that has less than half of a gram of trans fat per serving, they can actually list it as zero grams of trans fat. Um, so scanning the uh, ingredient list on the product and seeing if you see hydrogenated oils or partially hydrogenated oils, if you see those in the ingredient list, it means that um, there is at least some, uh, even if it's a small amount, um, trans fat in the product that you're consuming. So if you have multiple servings, you might end up having, you know, one to two grams of trans fat and you might not even realize. So just being careful with the food labels can also help. So in order to help reduce our saturated and trans fat intake, there are some tips. Um, choosing baked, broiled, or grilled foods um, as much as possible and avoiding fried foods. Um, trying vegetarian meals here and there. Some people like to do meatless Monday. You know, other people like to, you know, try to have a whole um, week with just uh, plant-based, you know, just to try it out, you know, more of a vegetarian diet, but even just one meal, you know, swapping out meat for beans or lentils or tofu, um, that helps to cut back a little bit on the saturated fat intake. Reading food labels, um, on the food label, you will see um, the percent daily value for each nutrient. Um, just a rule of thumb, anything with 5% or less of the daily value is considered um, low in that nutrient and anything with 20% or more of the daily value is considered to be high in that nutrient. So when we're looking for foods um, that are more heart healthy, we want things that are less than 5% of the daily value for saturated fat and zero grams of trans fat. And again, looking at that ingredient list just to make sure that it doesn't contain um, hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oils. Um, fatty fish like salmon, tuna, herring, mackerel, you know, these are all really good options. Um, they provide us with omega-3 unsaturated fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory, um, including nuts and nut butters. Um, that helps to um, make sure that we're getting some more unsaturated fat. Um, avocado as well, um, checking the oil. So making sure we're having, you know, olive oil and canola oil and some other heart healthy options. Um, these are all ways to make sure that we're getting more unsaturated fat rather than uh, saturated and trans fat. Um, another uh, risk factor for stroke is uncontrolled diabetes. So individuals with diabetes are already one and a half times more likely to have a stroke than individuals without diabetes. Um, so if you do have diabetes, it's very important to make sure that we keep the blood sugars under control within your target range um, and also the A1C less than seven. Um, each person will have individualized goals, but overall um, the goal is really to keep the A1C less than 7%. And, um, you know, some organizations even recommend keeping it under 6.5%. So it depends on the person, but managing your blood sugars can definitely, you know, help to reduce your risk of stroke if you have diabetes. So taking your medications as prescribed, following a healthy diet, um, doing physical activity that you enjoy, these are all factors that can help with diabetes management. Regularly monitoring your blood sugar can help you to understand how your food choices and meal compositions, um, you know, affect your blood glucose level. So nowadays, um, technology is really helpful for a lot of people with diabetes. So, um, you know, there are the traditional blood glucose monitors that you do a finger stick and check your sugar. Um, but now, especially for people who are on insulin injections, um, there are continuous glucose monitors that are very helpful. Um, they allow you to just scan the, the sensor or, you know, it, it hooks up to your phone or a reader um, and it continuously monitors your sugar throughout the day. Some of them even have alerts if you're dropping too low or if you're above your target glucose. So technology continues to evolve and really help with diabetes management. 
Um, so any carbohydrate food that you're that you'll eat or any beverage that has carbohydrate is going to be broken down and digested into glucose, which is blood sugar, and that's going to cause your blood glucose level to increase. Um, insulin's job once that blood sugar starts to rise, whether you make your own insulin or you have to take insulin injections, insulin's job is to allow that glucose or blood sugar to get out of the bloodstream and into your cells so that you can use it um, for energy or store it for future. Uh, maintaining the right balance between carbohydrate and insulin, whether your body is producing it or you're taking it via multiple daily injections or insulin pump, it helps to regulate your, regulate your blood glucose level. So each person will have an ind individualized um, goal for carbohydrates at meals and snacks, but some general recommendations for carbohydrate intake at meals are listed in the table on the right. Um, so for women, um, if the goal is weight loss, um, 30 to 45 grams of carbohydrate at meals, and for men, 45 to 60 grams to maintain current weight, for women, 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrate at meals, or for men, 60 to 75 grams. And again, this can be very different for each individual. Um, and whether your meal plan includes snacks or not is also you know, individualized. So really following up with your diabetes care team, meeting with your registered dietitian and diabetes care and education specialists to make sure that you're on track with your goals and they can assist you with any um, issues that you may be having with diabetes management. So carbohydrate counting is a method that a lot of people with diabetes use to help control their blood sugars. Um, a carbohydrate choice is referring to a portion of food um, that has 15 grams of carbohydrate. So for example, a one ounce slice of classic sandwich bread is roughly around 15 grams of carbohydrate. Everything that's listed on this um, little picture here, um, the serving size is equal to 15 grams of carbohydrate. And the idea is that we can exchange these different foods in and out of you know, your, the, your meal plan without changing the carbohydrate content of your meal or snack or the calorie content. So a slice of sandwich bread or a half a cup of oatmeal, one small piece of fruit, um, a third of cup, a cup of cooked pasta or rice, these are all equal to 15 grams of carbohydrate. And it's not that you can only have one carbohydrate choice. It's just knowing your goal. You know, if you have your goal is three carbohydrate choices per meal, then we can have that one cup of pasta or rice. And that would be our three um, carbohydrate choices for our meal. Or if we have a sandwich on classic sandwich bread, we've used two carbohydrate choices and we have one left if we want a small piece of fruit or some other carbohydrate food with our meal. Um, the idea is that the total carbohydrate from any food often has a similar impact on the blood glucose levels. Of course, we want to be choosing more healthy sources of carbohydrate, like whole grains and other higher fiber items, but carbohydrate in general is going to cause an impact on our, our blood glucose levels. Um, the number of carbohydrate choices, again, um, that you need depends on your lifestyle, your medications, your meal planning goals, weight goals. So we really do want to be working with a dietitian and also, you know, potentially endocrinologist or your primary care physician, really um, your whole diabetes um, care team to make sure that um, you're following your meal plan and that your goals are being met. A dietitian um, can definitely help you to determine the appropriate amount of carbs for you and help you to put your meal plan into practice. Label reading is also very important. Um, looking at the nutrition facts label to determine the amount of carbohydrate in a food if you have the label is um, the best thing to do because things may vary. Different products may have different nutrition facts on them, um, different brands may use, you know, different ingredients and especially foods like bread, um, they can vary quite a bit with carbohydrate content. You can have a light wheat uh, slice of bread that's light and airy and maybe have, you know, six grams of carbohydrate, or we might have a very dense and thick piece of bread that might be more towards 20 grams of carbohydrate. So if we have the label for our product, we really want to be using that. Um, so the next thing, you know, the first thing you want to do is look at the serving size. Um, if you're eating more or less than the serving size, then you're going to want to adjust the information on the label to reflect that. 
Um, so for example, if the serving size is one slice of bread on a nutrition facts label, but you're having a sandwich, we're going to look at the total carbohydrate for the serving size and then double it because we're having two slices of bread. If we're just having a slice of toast with breakfast and the serving size is one slice of bread, we can look at the total carbohydrate content for that slice and that's the carbohydrate that we're getting for that item. Um, so looking at the total carbohydrate is important. Um, underneath it, you're going to see the fiber, the sugars, the added sugars, they're already within that total carbohydrate number. Um, so we don't need to count them. Of course, we want to um, look at look for products that are higher in fiber and lower in added sugars, but that total carb carbohydrate number is going to tell you how many grams of carbohydrate that you're getting from the serving of that product. So until you're able to see a registered dietitian or you know, a diabetes care and education specialist um, to go over your nutrition plan a little bit more in depth, you can use the diabetes starter meal plan, which is kind of like the plate method, um, but just geared towards people with diabetes. Uh, so it can help you with portion control until you're able to get a more personalized meal plan. So using a nine inch plate um, and the guidelines will help you to uh, maintain good portion control and manage your blood sugars without um, measuring things out. So filling half of your plate with non-starchy vegetables, um, really varying the colors. Some examples of, of um, non-starchy vegetables that you can incorporate would be broccoli, carrots, tomatoes, leafy greens, cucumbers, green beans, cauliflower, and asparagus, um, definitely not limited to those, but those are some good examples. Um, filling a quarter of your plate with either meat or a meat substitute or some form of protein. Examples would be poultry, fish, eggs, tofu, and other lean meats. And then the other quarter of your plate will be your carbohydrate foods, such as whole grain bread or tortillas, ground rice, quinoa, pasta, corn, potatoes, peas, um, these all count as your starch for the meal, um, comparing the food labels and again, trying to choose the higher fiber foods when you can is important to make sure that you're getting enough fiber and the fiber can actually also act as kind of a speed bump to increasing your blood sugar level. So it slows digestion a bit. It keeps you satisfied for longer and it slows that rise in blood sugar after your meal. And then also the just um, for hydration, focusing on mainly water or any other zero calorie drink, you know, that will also help with blood sugar control if we're minimizing, you know, the, the drinks that have calories because they usually only just further increase our blood sugar. Um, and lastly, just checking in with a nutrition professional. So whether you have any chronic health conditions that can be managed through nutrition or you just want to make sure that you're eating healthy and really helping to prevent stroke or other chronic illnesses, um, the outpatient nutrition counseling services that are offered at the ambulatory care center are excellent. Um, they do have telehealth and in-person appointments available. The contact information, the phone number is listed on this slide. Um, and just make sure that you do have a referral or a prescription from your doctor when you call to make an appointment. Thank you.